I'm Hal Ali, the coordinator of Easter Alliance for Global Health Partnerships and Easter Island. These webinars take place on Fridays at 12 p.m. GMT, and every week we host experts from healthcare and global health fields to discuss various aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are delighted today to co-organize today's webinar with TIZ, the, the German Agency for International Cooperation, and THED, Tropical Health and Education Tr uh, Trust. GIZ uh, offers consulting and capacity building services in a wide range of areas, including management, consulting, uh, sustainable infrastructure, security, and peace building. THED is a specialist global health organization that educates, trains, and supports health workers through partnerships, strengthening health systems, and enabling people in low and middle income countries to access essential health care. For more information about GIZ, and third, please visit their website. The title of today's webinar is Leaving No One Behind, Keeping Up Essential Services for Non-Communicable Diseases uh, Patients in Ethiopia During the Time of COVID-19 uh, Response. A recording of this webinar will be available in our website and YouTube channel shown on the screen, Irish Global Health and Easter Alliance for Global Health Partnerships. Live streaming is also available right now on our YouTube channel, Irish Global Health Network. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the question and answer feature in the bottom of the screen. We are excited and delighted today our, to welcome our moderator today, Prof. Mergesa Kaba. Prof. Mergesa is an associate professor of public health at the School of Public Health at Addis Ababa University, with his proactive focus on the areas of social and behavioral health. For now, I will hand it over to Prof. Mergesa to introduce the speakers and lead the panel discussion. Welcome, Melissa. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Hala, for your kind uh, introduction. Uh, I'm so happy uh, moderating this um, session uh, from Ethiopia. Um, Non-communicable disease uh, in Ethiopia is one of the emerging concerns of public health threats. And with COVID, uh, obviously, it is getting complicated. And the today's uh, session basically is going to look into uh, those details. Uh, today, we have uh, a number of speakers. Uh, please allow me to introduce each one of them um, so that um, um, you would also um, connect uh, faces uh, to speakers. The first one is, um, uh, Professor Adamu Adise. Um, Professor Adamu is from the School of Public Health at Sababa University from the Department of Preventive Medicine. He is um, one of the founding um, chair of the Non-Communicable Disease Epidemiology, Epidemiology Research Working Group within the school. Uh, and uh, he is also um, the, the founder of Field Epidemiology Training Program within uh, the School of Public Health at Addis Ababa University. Currently, um, uh, Dr. Adamu coordinates COVID-19 um, emergency operations uh, response uh, within the Tukuran Basa Specialized Hospital. Tukuran Basa Specialized Hospital is one of the biggest um, and probably the only um, tertiary level um, hospital in the country. After him, we have Ms. Bezawit Katama, Bezawit Kantama uh, is a lecturer within the same school, the School of uh, Public Health at Addis Ababa University, uh, Department of uh, Preventive Medicine. Uh, with clinical uh, nursing background, um, Bezawit has done her master's in public health and is currently doing her PhD uh, at, at the Martin Luther uh, University uh, Halle in Germany uh, with a project that looks into increasing non-communicable disease screening practices in rural setup uh, of Ethiopia. She is also playing an uh, important role within the advisory council uh, of COVID-19 re COVID response in the country. Following um, Ms. Bezawit, uh, we have Dr. Dasalo Makunen. Dr. Dasalo Makunen is a consultant internist and a cardiologist at uh, the Kurambasa Specialized Hospital College of Health Sciences within the same university, Addis Ababa University. He is also an associate professor as the Division of Cardiology, Department of Internal Medicine. Um, and uh, he is also the current uh, president of the Ethiopian Society 
of internal medicine. Um, following him, uh, we have, um, I'm, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Ya Yosef Mammo. Um, Dr. Yosef Mammo uh, is TENA um, country representative. TENA in Ethiopian language, uh, in Amharic language, means health. And he's a qualified medical doctor, general internal medicine. Um, he had been working for Jima University, um, chronic disease project, and uh, is an advisor uh, for the NCD case team of the Ministry of Health, uh, which is supported by uh, TET, uh, Tropical Health and Education Trust uh, in the UK. Um, between uh, 2016 and 18, uh, Dr. Yosef worked as a volunteer consultant at Hospice Center in Ethiopia and uh, patient care at Washington Medical Center. Uh, the past uh, two years, he has been leading um, um, the TET effort to support the Ministry of Health to decentralize non-communicable disease uh, prevention and control program. Uh, finally, we have uh, one of our speakers from, um, from the Addis Ababa um, Health uh, Office, um, Mr. Wenderson uh, Berhe. He's trying to uh, connect. Uh, he's a nurse by background with a bachelor um, degree in psychology and is currently the NCD team leader uh, of the Addis Ababa Regional Health Bureau, um, and uh, he will um, he will be uh, joining us. I hope um, um, soon. Um, each of our speakers will have eight minutes, um, and I'll remind them when they um, remain with their two minutes, um, so that we can have more time for uh, discussion. And the participants are kindly requested. To, uh, to drop their questions uh, in the drop um, in the drop box, uh, we have chat box. So in that chat box, if you leave your um, your questions specifying to whom it's meant, then uh, we will pick those questions uh, and uh, continue. Um, and uh, with that, um, I think we can move um, to the next uh, speaker. Um, Buari, do you have anything? Yes, please. Okay, so I'm just going, just starting to share my screen and uh, Ellen, you just need to approve it as well, I think. Yeah, so, uh, so um, he, uh, Professor um, Rari Buga uh, is a webinar anchor um, and he's a former head of epidemiology and uh, uh, public health um, at, uh, um, at um, RCSI. I'm very sorry to uh, keep it uh, as abbreviated as it is uh, in Ireland, but uh, you may tell us what that means, uh, Professor. Please go ahead. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Kaba. Um, is, it, is it coming through, um, Ellen? No, not quite yet. Have you approved it? Yes, you should be good to go. Yeah, it just seems to be a little, a little slow coming through there for some reason. Are you seeing anything? Not quite yet. Mm. Yeah, I think if it doesn't, uh, they. I have it as desktop, but. Uh, no problem. Live share through. Oh wait, I didn't do the share. Maybe that. Ah, there you go. Perfect. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I, I'm very slow, uh, Professor Kaba. Um, and uh, firstly, just to say how delighted I am um, to be part of this. And as some people know, uh, Ethiopia is uh, going to be a very special country for me. And I look forward to meeting uh, many of you uh, once I move to uh, Addis Ababa, which I don't know will be before the end of the year or maybe at the beginning of 2021, um, depending on the. Uh, on the epidemic. So uh, as many of the listeners know, we do uh, just an overview of the COVID-19 uh, epidemic. And um, trying to just do a screen, ah, there we are. So um, in this first slide here, this is just uh, an overview I gave Irish Aid and um, for Department of Foreign Affairs yesterday, just a reminder of uh, how COVID-19 COVID affects people. And uh, the real problems are when the infection moved from the nose and the throat to the lungs. And these are some of the, um, 
the clinical findings that caused the major problems, the shortness of breath, the hypoxia. Uh, and a reminder that oxygen is the most important treatment. You don't need mechanical ventilation to uh, manage most cases. But where the longer term residual effects are and how it can sometimes affect younger people is through this cytokine storm, which is an overreaction of the immune system that leads to uh, blood coagulation, blood clotting problems uh, across the different body systems. One of the reasons I put in this slide is because the, the, the risk factors, the ones um, both here in, in, in high income countries, but also low and middle income countries are actually many of them the subject of today's webinar, the non-communicable uh, disease um, conditions. Case fatality rates um, uh, depend on how many cases are being uh, picked up, much greater than influenza. But we do need to remember that most people, including 80% uh, of, of those over 80 years of age, do recover. I put in there asymptomatic uh, as, as 10 times more common than symptomatic infections. But actually in, in sub-Saharan Africa, we're probably seeing an even higher proportion of asymptomatic condition, uh, asymptomatic infections. This is a slide that we show each week and I, I'm not going to dwell on it today, but I did have figures two days ago and found there were quite a lot of changes just over two days. Uh, I've only put in a, a comparison over a period of three weeks there for Ethiopia, just to show um, not only is Ethiopia presenting what four times, five times as many cases uh, over, over the last uh, two weeks, over the last three weeks that should be, but also if you look right over to test per million population, its testing capacity has been ramped up um, considerably. So here's a slide uh, which, which is a new one. And one of the reasons is because I just want to draw your attention to this paper, which came out in Science on the 10th of June. It includes authors from the Imperial College Group. And these are the sort of modeling um, epidemic curves that we've seen from them. This one here is showing two different things. It's showing, if you see the, the, the curves there on the left, it's daily mortality rates per, per million. Uh, and this very high curve uh, shows in the presence of a poor response uh, by the health services uh, and with very limited health care, we're going to see much higher mortality rates. Whereas here with a, a poor response, let's say a, a lack of closures, a lack of um, physical distancing, uh, but a, a more effective healthcare response, we're seeing lower mortality rates, about one fifth. Here is um, where there's a more effective response on this side. Uh, the mortality rates are much lower, but they will depend on the effectiveness of the healthcare system. And I think that's relevant to uh, today's um, uh, presentations. Here's another new slide, and it's actually based on, on a paper that I just haven't read properly up to now. And because of today's uh, um, uh, uh, webinar is about leaving no one behind. It's about the effects on the, the, uh, the more vulnerable, the poorer populations. And this is modeling work that was done by the Imperial Group. And while I don't think you can always trust their models in terms of the numbers, it is a very good analysis in there about uh, the differences between the wealthiest 20% and the poorest 20% in low and middle income countries. And it's just drawn out three factors there that would account for a 32% higher death rate among the poorest 20%. Geographical and financial access to healthcare. So that's relevant to today's uh, webinar. But then these, are these other factors, if Niall is on, he'll be glad to see hand washing in there occupational risk, Father Michael Kelly has drawn attention to that and the gender dimensions. And here are just other risk mediators that impact on poverty, age and household structure, food insecurity, um, and vulnerable and displaced populations. They don't talk about these other comorbidities, but I put them in because they're uh, particularly relevant. The NCDs that we're going to be talking about today, which, uh, and I suppose the question to the panel, in, in high income countries like Ireland, we actually see a higher uh, prevalence of some of these conditions among the poor. 
populations. But what, what, what's the situation in Ethiopia? Um, because it may be that, say, obesity might actually be more common among the wealthier population, where in Ireland, we actually see obesity more common in the poorer population. And then there's the infectious diseases. I'm just going to shoot through a, a few slides now quickly. I think there may be parallels between the impact of COVID-19 on mother and child health, which we looked at um, two weeks ago. Um, I think the next slide is, is more interesting in a way, because here we're picking out some of the particular uh, dimensions of care which, which are being uh, affected by COVID-19 or be affected by the responses to COVID-19, particularly where lockdowns happen. Uh, and it's about you know, the drug supply, in particular, access to a clean birth environment, as for the women who die in childbirth, uh, uh, malnutrition, wasting, a, a, a major factor uh, which can result from lockdowns, uh, but also can be contributed to by COVID-19 impacting on food supplies. But it, these other ones really relate to the, the, the healthcare system and how it is affected by COVID. So two okay. minutes, Rory. Great, thank you. Thank you, Professor Kaba. We've looked at this one before and there may be parallels with, uh, with NCDs and how uh, HIV AIDS and tuberculosis are impacted in particular. Um, We've looked at a similar model earlier, but I'm just drawing attention to uh, this issue, which I will be looking forward to hearing the panel on. How is the response? Are there closures of, of, of neighborhoods maybe impacting on people's ability to access health care? And that raises the issue. What are the appropriate responses? So I, I'm, I'm hoping the panel will, will talk to how the responses to COVID are supporting or undermining the responses to uh, to uh, 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 NCD management. Um, this is a slide we show often. Um, there's an update on the link to it. Uh, the, probably the best uh, um, publication from WHO that's come out I, 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 in terms of LMICs and it came out quite uh, early on in March. And I think it's a relevant one that might be uh, relevant today. Final slide. Um, and I'd just like to draw your attention again to a new paper out in Global Health, uh, well worth reading. You've got the, the link to it there. And it's about what the middle ground should be, particularly in low-income countries such as Africa, not aiming for full suppression, aiming to limit the spread, mitigate the harms, the harms that come from COVID, but the harms that come from control efforts that may not be appropriate to the setting and shielding those at risk. So many thanks, uh, Professor Kaba. Really looking forward to this uh, webinar and, and perhaps I will come in later. So thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Ruari. Uh, this is quite uh, useful um, slides. Um, so just a reminder for the rest of the speakers as well, uh, eight minutes uh, means eight minutes. And for the rest of participants, please note that we'll be running for an hour and a half uh, for this particular uh, seminar, unlike one hour, one hour seminar um, that you uh, have earlier, because we have uh, more speakers. So we move to um, um, Dr. Adamu, uh, who will be talking about the COVID situation uh, in Ethiopia, as well as um, share with us uh, experiences with NCD uh, within the School of uh, Public Health at Salva University. The floor is yours, uh, uh, Dr. Adamu. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mergisa. And I would like to thank the organizers of the, the event uh, for the very kind invitation and uh, the coordination of uh, uh, activities around this topic. Um, so I am Adamu Adise. I'm from uh, Addis Ababa University, based at the School of Public Health, and uh, closely work uh, uh, with the NCD Epidemiology Working uh, Group. Um, and I'm asked to speak on this topic, the COVID-19 updates uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, so I will focus more on that. And I thought I had 10 minutes, but Mergisa just said eight minutes. So I'll try to move as fast as possible. Uh, the outline of my presentation will be as follows. I will uh, give a very uh, brief overview of the national situation uh, epidemiologically, but also what response measures are there and a uh, few points on 
currently observed challenges in the COVID uh, response. And then I want to briefly also introduce the NCD uh, uh, epidemiology working group at uh, our uh, uh, university and our collaborators. So coming to the COVID-19 situation in, in the country, um, the first report of uh, a case was made in the 13th of March, uh, 2020. That's uh, 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 about, uh, uh, more than, I think a little more than 12 weeks. And um, when we see the trajectory, so we have had a very slow uh, build up of cases uh, over the last uh, about 10 weeks. And then suddenly we have a surge of cases as was reported by the, uh, the earlier presenter. And as we stand, as we speak today, uh, I haven't looked at the, the report, uh, the really report for today, but based on uh, the latest update from yesterday, we have close to 4,000 uh, confirmed cases reported and 65 uh, uh, days is related to COVID. And um, so to reach to the first thousand, it took us uh, uh, about 77 days, according to a report released recently by PHI. And the next thousand was attained only in, in, in a week time, so another seven days. So you can see how fast the number of cases is increasing uh, in the country. So if you visit the, uh, the Worldometer, it usually gives you a live update of uh, the situation. And we have close to thousand uh, recovered uh, uh, from it. Just a few uh, graphs. Uh, as you could see, uh, uh, you know, we are, it, it looks like we are just climbing up into the, the, AP, the AP curve. Uh, uh, so, you know, it's, now the direction is uh, in, that, in that line. And the number of uh, reports of new cases is also increasing. So we have uh, uh, reached to um, uh, uh, th three digit reports. So uh, like the hundreds, uh, that's what I mean. Uh, and it might, might possibly increase. This is a country of uh, 110 uh, million. And we, we, yeah, so as the uh, infection goes out of Addis, we might possibly have a different picture in the coming weeks. The same with the number of cases, as the number of cases increased, the number of days also is, is, is increasing. And again, we are climbing up in the, in the, in the graph. Uh, the same with the number of days reported on, uh, on the daily basis. Um, so this is a chart showing uh, the, 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 the number of active cases. The epicenter is uh, in Addis, uh, the, the capital. Uh, and within Addis, we have some sub-cities sub out of the 10. Sub, some sub-cities which are epicenters within, within the epicenter, like the Addis Katama, where we have had the national uh, the bus coach station. Um, so, uh, and a lot of overcrowding and petty trade in that area. And this continues possibly to be a challenge uh, uh, in the coming weeks again. When we look at the profile of uh, cases uh, reported, uh, I mean, according to the reports we have uh, so far, most of the confirmed cases are without symptoms, more than half. And then uh, the, the, the next majority are those with very mild uh, symptoms. So those with moderate and severe uh, symptoms are um, very small. I apologize for the quality of the graph, uh, but this is the gray curve is those with moderate and the yellow is with, with severe. So fortunately, we have uh, less proportion of uh, uh, severe uh, cases on and on those on critical care, and we this might possibly continue. And this could be explained by the predominantly young population that we have. Possibly, there could be also other factors. Coming to the national response, the national response is led by mainly by the Ministry of Health, and the minister is at the top of uh, all the major activities nationally, and she gives daily ministerial briefings on the situation on daily basis. And the National Public Health Institute, EPHI, it's, it stands for Ethiopian Public Health Institute, is in charge of uh, most of the technical aspects like the testing, contact uh, tracing, and other uh, support activities, including coordinating 
treatment centers. And the Ministry of the De developed several uh, guidelines, including about continuity of essential services, geared after, I think, the WHO uh, gu guideline mentioned er earlier on. And there are several advisory teams composed to advise the minister and uh, her team on how to go about uh, the response, and they are heavily engaged uh, uh, nationally. There is also a national task force and a ministerial committee led by uh, the prime minister, and uh, a state of emergency is al already declared, as uh, my Ethiopian colleagues would know, uh, to, to, to support most of the public health interventions and uh, guide uh, uh, policy uh, and interventions as well in the time of a pandemic. And just a week ago, the, uh, our election, which was due to be conducted uh, in the summer, is postponed uh, officially by the parliament. And there are uh, non-pharmaceutical uh, measures, uh, again, implemented uh, all over the country, universal masking. Uh, hand washing is now a trend in most places, especially public places. Uh, there are also measures related to reducing the number of uh, uh, those riding in public transports by half. Uh, and there is also repurposing of the health system uh, by allocating facilities into COVID and non-COVID treatment facilities. Uh, and testing also uh, has been uh, ramped up over the last months, especially, and we have over 40 testing uh, uh, centers uh, in the country. And as was reported earlier on, Ethiopia has one of the highest figures of testing compared to cases, uh, even globally. And this is a Millennium Hall, the, uh, an exhibition center turned into a treatment center, a thousand bed treatment center close to the airport. Some of the challenges to mention include adherence to uh, the non-pharmaceutical interventions like social distancing to, to mention. And I mean, the response actually was, uh, the, re the response was very high at the early days in the first week of um, when we had the first case reported. But over time, it looks like, like there is some, uh, uh, yes, some leniency um, and so uh, this is an observation actually. Um, apart from that, it is a, a challenge also to maintain hand hygiene because the facilities we have at, at the public areas as well as at home are, are not uh, um, conducive in general. Uh, there is high um, uh, family size and the number of rooms per family are not optimum. So there are lots of challenges uh, uh, associated with that. Health-seeking behavior, again, uh, due to the, some of the factors mentioned by the earlier speaker, we have observed low turnout to health facilities by uh, uh, clients and, and patients, and has affected uh, the, the, the maintenance of some essential services. Uh, 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 so we have moved into a community trans to spread transmission and other can also continue to be uh, a challenge um, and possibly we'll have some mortality associated with that and uh, we need to be ready to, for, to, for, to, to handle this. There is a universal problem of uh, uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, especially for the healthcare workers and we have uh, also a good number of health workers already affected by the virus. Uh, on, from the social angle, there has been a high degree of panic associated with this, even from uh, uh, the, the medical professionals. Uh, we have witnessed uh, levels of stigma and discrimination and even the reports of suicide because of this. And there is a lot of um, information, wrong information flowing in, in several directions. So the infodemics is another problem which is parallelly running across and the health system has uh, COVID minutes, on top Dr. of Adam. other uh, health priorities. Thank you. On top of other competing priorities. So maintaining uh, the right balance is a, a challenge for the health system. So it's just to mention a few of uh, the, cha the challenges among, among several. Just to briefly take you through what's happening at the National Hospital, the Kurambasa Hospital, which is a, a which is a national referral and teaching hospital with a capacity of a thousand beds and over 
uh, 2,500 health workers. So the hospital started its preparation in response uh, as early as the first report was made, even before actually, and uh, tried to lead the response in a very structured uh, and uh, uh, informed planning uh, process. So this is uh, the, the list of events actually, which took over since uh, mid, mid of March. So we have conducted uh, readiness assessment in the facility and uh, moved into preparing an emergency preparedness plan. Uh, and we have started continuously monitoring the capacity uh, of the facility. Sorry, Dr. Adamo, I'm going to stop you. In can you wrap? Sorry, can you wrap yeah? in, in a minute? I'm going to stop you, sorry. Just in a minute, yeah. wrap up. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So this is the assessment in the, the plan. Uh, we have an emergency operation center and these are the different teams. There is a team also looking at case management and maintenance of essential uh, services. Finally, just wanted to tell you about the NCD Epidemiology Working Group at the School of Public Health, uh, which works on generating uh, evidences related to non-communicable diseases for policy and program at, at a national uh, level. And we have been uh, working on several uh, research projects, uh, academic, but also implementation research, and trying to disseminate those uh, over, over the different fora uh, we had. Uh, and uh, we had, we have several partners and our main partner ha has been uh, Martin Luther University from Germany. Uh, and uh, uh, through that link, we have had several support from the German government, including GIZ. And we closely work with the Ministry of Health uh, in Ethiopia and we continue to uh, work on, on the same uh, angle. Thank you very much for your attention and apologies for taking a few minutes over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Adamu. Um, um, he was presenting two different things, so um, you can imagine um, uh, why he has taken extra minute or so. So uh, we move to the next speaker, um, Ms. Bezawit Katama. She is going to share with us um, the, the voices of the public with respect to um, uh, NCD services, um, uh, as well as the voices from the provider. So the floor is yours, um, Bezawit, and uh, keep the eight minutes mark. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Dr. Medusa, and uh, greetings to everyone. Uh, thank you, the organizers, uh, for having me here today. I'm delighted to share you uh, what I have. Uh, based on the qualitative study that uh, me and my team have conducted. And for the study entitled uh, Non-Communicable Disease Management at the Time of COVID-19 in Ethiopia, we have interviewed uh, 22 study participants, NCD patients and healthcare professionals working in the management of non-communicable diseases with the objective to explore the challenges and coping strategies in NCD management uh, during COVID-19. Uh, therefore, this presentation today is uh, uh, going to be from the voice of my uh, study participants as precise as possible to fit the eight minutes. Uh, so the presentation is basically addressed uh, the challenges posed by uh, COVID-19 and the coping strategies. So the first one is uh, challenges posed by COVID-19 in the provision of NCD services as per the voice of uh, 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 NCD patients. They uh, forwarded uh, fear of COVID infection, transportation problem, absence of social and economic support, and notes uh, welcoming healthcare facilities and stress related to uh, high risk uh, perception as a challenge. And a typical uh, 52 years old hypertension patient, uh, for example, said uh, even if we could manage the transportation problem, uh, we are still afraid of acquiring COVID-19 in the healthcare facilities, so uh, we prefer to stay at home at all. Uh, for that, I quit my work, uh, said by uh, a 52 years old hypertension patient. Another typical response by an old, uh, uh, by an old woman, uh, hyper, uh, diabetic patient, uh, she said that uh, before COVID-19, my neighbors uh, used to visit me almost every day, and they were 
a lot of financial and emotional support and nowadays nobody is coming and she said that uh, there were there is a lot of challenges uh, in taking her medication even uh, and uh, from the voice of the healthcare professionals who are working in the management of non-communicable diseases uh, they verbalized that uh, currently there is a decreased NCD patient flow uh, by 40 to 60 percent as they perceive and they uh, uh, and they uh, fear uh, that the clients might discontinue their medication. So a typical neurologic uh, neurologist uh, nephrologist uh, working at a public hospital in Adi say that nowadays we came to finish our morning card at 11 a.m. Whereas before COVID, we had been working on the morning cards until 1 p.m. So this shows that uh, the decreased uh, patient flow, NCD patient flow to the healthcare facilities. And with regard to uh, false education to the NCD patients, uh, a nurse who was working in a diabetes clinic uh, verbalized that uh, after COVID, uh, we stopped giving health education and what is uh, very pertinent for our uh, patients. So she emphasized that this educational component is very pertinent, especially uh, for those diabetic patients on how to take their medication and their diet and other things. So uh, with regard to the phone clinic, uh, there are a lot of challenges that the healthcare professionals have forwarded. And for example, a resident diabetic uh, DM specialist uh, who is working in a public hospital said that we don't have a special training in conducting this uh, virtual clinic or phone clinic. Uh, so we are challenging a lot and we are stressful, especially in deciding the appointment date or where, uh, when to appoint the clients, uh, whether to uh, uh, allow them to come, invite them to come to the facility or to delay and so on. Uh, so apart from the uh, challenges, uh, both the NCD patients as well as the uh, healthcare professionals have developed their uh, coping strategies. And as per the voice of the clients, uh, they almost all say that uh, home stay or staying at home as a best strategy because they are at a high uh, uh, fear of acquiring uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, while they are getting out of home. So that uh, they say that uh, nowadays, for example, a typical IMCD patient say that uh, nowadays, I do not even go out for groceries. Uh, for example, today I came here to take my medication, uh, but I came by walking for two hours almost. So she is afraid of taking transportation and so on. Uh, but almost all uh, NCD patients uh, show that uh, they are almost uh, giving up uh, they are in a high uh, fear so that uh, they are just waiting for a miracle or a divine intervention or something from higher power. So most of them say that uh, almost uh, unless God do something for us uh, uh, or to, unless God protects us from all the bad outcomes, we are at a higher risk and we cannot manage by our capacity. So uh, that shows that they just gave up and this is uh, from the old man uh, colorectal patient. Uh, but from the healthcare professional side, they verbalize that they are using uh, strategies to manage uh, this COVID-19 uh, for continuation of this uh, NCD service. And uh, they almost all are using a virtual clinic, uh, even though it has a lot of challenge. So a cancer specialist gave us a typical response uh, she said that even though the phone clinic uh, by itself has a lot of limitations, uh, we are managing our clients virtually over phone to minimize uh, their uh, risk of acquiring COVID infection while they are coming to the healthcare facilities. Uh, but like uh, in incomplete uh, information, uh, for example, some uh, patients do not have the, their contact information uh, in their patient card. Uh, maybe uh, for those who have uh, their contact information might not be uh, available by that number and so on. So uh, a lot of challenges they have forwarded. Other than that, as uh, coping strategies, they mentioned the community engagement, especially at the primary healthcare facilities. Uh, they say that, uh, for example, a typical NCD focal person who is working at the primary healthcare facilities said that uh, healthcare professionals 
currently going house to house for COVID-19 testing. And now uh, while they are going to house to house for that purpose, they are uh, asking as well uh, for a presence of NCD patients. And uh, if there is an NCD patient and if that NCD patient has any health need or any health problem and so on. So this is uh, what we call a community engagement. So this phone clinic, usage of phone clinic and community engagement are typical uh, coping strategies forwarded by our study participants, uh, healthcare professionals. So upon this brief uh, verbalizations, uh, Bezawit, me and you, have, um, Bezawit, you have a minute and a half. <laughs> upon this uh, verbalizations, uh, we have uh, concluded that uh, the postponement of the routine medical appointments and the NCD management may disrupt the continuity of uh, care for NCD patients and this disruption of the routine health service together with the uh, stress and avoidance of physical activity might increase uh, morbidity, mortality uh, and disability for those NCD patients. So that we recommend that any COVID-19 prevention and control strategies at all levels to target uh, NCDs differently. So thank you so much for uh, your time and attention. Very good. Um, thank, thank you so much, uh, uh, Bizawit, uh, for this excellent presentation. So um, we move on. Um, we, we will have um, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Dasalo Makonan, um, um, a consultant internist and a cardiologist uh, who would uh, actually tell us experiences within uh, the uh, Rambasa Hospital itself. So the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Dasalo, and eight minutes. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Miguel Sakawa and the uh, organizers of uh, this uh, uh, conference. Uh, so uh, I am the outpatient director of the Tokorambasa Specialized Hospital and uh, the uh, physician by profession. The Tokorambasa Specialized Hospital is a tertiary care facility uh, of the country having uh, 51 uh, specialty, subspecialty and su super specialty clinics and we see half a million uh, patients um, per year and majority of uh, our patients uh, will have uh, non-communicable disease having a regular follow-up and the pool of uh, patients are increasing uh, from time to time. Uh, so uh, following uh, COVID after March 13, 2020, after the first case of uh, COVID was detected, we face uh, challenges uh, from uh, our patients that especially the second week of uh, March and the third week of March, majority of patients uh, disappear from follow-up and loss to follow-up. They reduce visit to outpatient uh, clinics. Uh, we face also uh, a lot of uh, anxiety and uh, panic among healthcare professionals as well as uh, uh, patients. And uh, for uh, this uh, problem, we uh, just there was also uh, a trend that uh, encourage patients to stay at home. And uh, it was a universal announcement that majority of patients are not uh, coming. And there was also travel restrictions, as you um, remember. And uh, we have uh, a reduction, about 40% of our patients who are expected to come to the hospital uh, disappeared. So for this uh, problem, we designed uh, a local uh, solution by uh, implementing a phone clinic. We just um, uh, discussed with physicians running uh, these uh, clinics, uh, the non-communicable disease uh, clinics, and uh, physicians uh, tried to call to patients uh, one week ahead before their appointment uh, because uh, uh, some patients, uh, uh, already, if we call them on the day of appointment, some are either they come to the hospital or they are uh, at their um, uh, on the way to the hospital or they are in the hospital. So we start calling them one week before um, their appointment and uh, try to manage them. But still, we face uh, challenges in implementing the phone clinics. One, we don't get uh, their contact number appropriately, so we are implementing electronic medical recording that we record every information of the patient, especially for adult patients. But still, uh, patients uh, might not have their own uh, uh, 
contact number, uh, and also it was a surprise for them as well, uh, receiving a call from a physician. So uh, there was some challenges, but later it uh, became better now. And uh, we, uh, we did an assessment for the eight outpatient clinics in the Department of Internal Medicine, and we compared with the previous uh, month's visit. For example, in December 2020, uh, we have seen, uh, in December 2019, we have seen 9,405 patients, but in April 2020, we see uh, 7,038 patients in the eight outpatient uh, clinics of internal medicine in non-communicable uh, diseases, and there was uh, 2,000 patients uh, lost from uh, follow-up, but we tried to reach around 1,352 patients through phone when, and we tried to uh, manage them. Uh, and these phone clinics are uh, run by physicians, volunteer physicians who are running the clinics, and they call by their uh, phone number, and they take these patients as a court of patients, meaning they follow them, they uh, receive their complaints uh, and uh, try to optimize their medications. If there is any to come to the hospital, they also evaluate these patients at the uh, hospital. Uh, by implementing uh, this, we tried to help a uh, few patients, but still non-communicable uh, disease uh, care and treatment service is uh, seriously affected. We can't uh, screen patients, we can't uh, effectively diagnose, we can't effectively treat, and we can't also effectively follow and manage uh, patients uh, because of uh, uh, these uh, problems, and patients are discontinuing their medications. For example, I'm a cardiologist by profession. Two of my patients discontinue their uh, anticoagulant uh, warfarin and developed uh, a stroke from, an atri uh, from atrial fibrillation in the month of uh, April. Uh, so, uh, as a solution, as a solution, we have to uh, uh, have um, uh, experience sharing from other centers, if any, so that how can we implement case management uh, services, adherence and support services to these patients, because we have seen good adherence to those uh, diseases having a program like HIV. For example, in our ART clinic, uh, the loss to follow up is less than 5%. Majority of patients are on treatment. When they are absent, there is a system that we call them and we track them. There is a mechanism for loss to follow up tracking mechanism, but we don't have a mechanism for other uh, non-communicable diseases. For example, in diabetes, we don't have that type of service so that when a patient is absent from follow up, we, we don't have a mechanism uh, to monitor. We uh, implemented- Okay. Two we minutes, implemented Dr. Sasson. Okay, for example, we implemented a nurse-led uh, clinic in our uh, hematology clinic, uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia, CML clinic. In that clinic, for example, uh, we don't have loss to follow up because the nurse uh, regularly call uh, to patients and uh, follows them. But this practice is not happening to other non-communicable diseases, including uh, cancer. So my recommendation is if we have an experience, experience from other centers that we can uh, collaborate on this issue. And if we provide mentoring in this uh, program, and also if we engage uh, the community health uh, extension workers in this program uh, would be uh, good. Uh, so this is uh, my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, thank you so much. Indeed, uh, this is really in time. Um, so we move to the next presenter. Uh, that's Dr. Yosef Mamo. Um, so Dr. Yosef, you have eight minutes and um, the floor is yours. Meanwhile, uh, please participants, you can um, um, put your questions in the chat box uh, so that we can actually address them after the presentations. Dr. Yosef. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mirgisa. Uh, and I also would like to thank uh, the organizers for uh, an opportunity to speak. My name is Yosef Mamu, and I will be sharing uh, on behalf of uh, the TNA Alliance uh, some of our work and some of the uh, scenario in the rural health centers. Uh, first of all, let me say something about TNA Alliance. This is uh, uh, an alliance uh, working towards increasing access to NCD care in rural uh, poor Ethiopia. 
It is a partnership of Tate, uh, uh, <clears throat> Southampton University, uh, Gondar and Jimma chronic disease uh, uh, projects, and also recently HPA, uh, Health Poverty Action, or otherwise known as Health Limited uh, in Ethiopia. The purpose is to synergize uh, our interests, experience, and capacity uh, to uh, on health interventions for the rural poor. So Tate has a rich experience in building partnership uh, between UK and uh, Ethiopian uh, health institutions, particularly teaching institutions. Southampton University is engaged in community health research and health uh, limited works on uh, communities, hard to reach communities such as pastoralists. So I think it's a good uh, combination. And the strategy is a chronic care model, which uh, a lot of uh, Ethiopian health workers know uh, as a, a kind of HIV program, how it is established. So a similar kind of, uh, uh, the same model of decentralization of care for access through task shifting, or sharing to mid-level or uh, frontline health workers as well as task simplification. And when we do, it is anybody who's familiar with HIV work would, quite, would, would find this uh, uh, very familiar. It's a capacity building, training, setting up services, medical recording and reporting, uh, the consolidative work, uh, working on quality, mentoring, supervision, reducing loss to follow up, uh, sh sharing best practices and access to essential medicine and supplies and uh, the demand creation where health extension workers will go down at the community level, raising awareness, there will be mass education, uh, improved health seeking behavior and screening campaigns to enroll uh, into the services of these uh, rural uh, uh, health institutions. So, it is uh, uh, the Ministry of Health has been working on this for uh, the last 10 years, preparing documents, plans, strategies, and so on. But it's only until two years ago that partners have appeared and donors have appeared to help a little bit, you know, a drop in the ocean, you may say. So there are uh, others than us, uh, there are uh, uh, three other partners, PSI, QAM, and Resolve to Save Lives and also uh, Pathfinder specifically working on, uh, uh, on uh, cervical cancer screening. Uh, so we particularly work uh, on uh, 60 facilities, most of them rural, uh, 15 hospitals and 45 health centers. The rest of the partners work on 180 facilities and uh, uh, together about 240 health centers, I mean, facilities are covered. This is, a, as I said, a drop in the ocean when you think of the 3,000 health centers we have in our country. So we work in six regions, and uh, this is closely supervised by the Ministry of Health so that partners do not duplicate or uh, uh, unnecessarily. So we work in uh, 12 semi-urban health centers and 24 uh, rural health centers. So our interest mainly is access. So at this time, the rural people do not know much about NCD. You have to increase the awareness so that they can uh, utilize the facilities. So the flow at this stage in rural health centers may be uh, very low, but it's an important step to educate uh, our people. So with regard to challenges to, due to COVID, I think I am afraid I will be repeating what uh, probably uh, Bezawit and uh, uh, Dr. Musganau uh, were uh, uh, saying, but the, the, what we can say is it's not as palpable. The problem is not yet as, as palpable as we see it in Addis and most uh, major cities. But one thing is for sure, there is a fear uh, among health workers as well as patients. So the health system as a result you can say is there is a paralysis of uncertainty of what to do. Uh, services are, more, are almost in most, appear to be in a standstill. 
patient, uh, health workers are afraid to get infection, uh, take it to their homes, to their families. Uh, rural patients are very afraid, as you know, uh, to come to uh, densely populated towns and cities. And in the early stage of panic, there was also restriction of movement. As a result, uh, patients' uh, attendance was affected. Uh, of course, there is lack of conf confidence or also going to the hospital, not only towns, uh, uh, because that, that's where pa pa patient, uh, patients, rural patients think uh, the infection comes from. The supply chain is... Uh, of two minutes, and other two minutes, Dr. Yosef. Okay. Okay. Is also a problem uh, because of a very clear reason that all of you are aware the supply chain, the competing priorities for COVID, and as well as the international problem of shipping and others have resulted in serious shortage of medicine. That's the complaints we hear from many of these rural clinics. And patients have to be referred to private pharmacies, and that is a, a problem with out-of-pocket cost increasing. Redeployment of uh, focal people, good uh, workers are moved to work on COVID, health extension workers are fully engaged on COVID. To a certain degree, it's uh, very good, and we expect that to happen, but it will definitely harm the, 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 the service to NCD. Uh, mass campaigns cannot be done because of the social distancing. And there is difficulty of screening, even measuring blood pressure, taking glucose, blood glucose measurements because of the proximity and the policy that without PPE, you cannot do that. Uh, so these are uh, some of the problems. The responses, briefly, we try to send, you know, triage do not exist in most of these rural clinics. We try to establish those and also distribution of infection prevention protocols through the PAC uh, guideline, as well as uh, uh, investing more time on mentoring in these areas, frugal innovation, so that they can make their own masks and face shields. These are some of the efforts, telephone communication of patients, reporting uh, data by telephone, uh, and so on, and other supporting financially local support, uh, supervision, and mentoring. Ministry of Health's uh, team has been out and assessing on the ground, and they have an assessment, but they could not come and attend today. Maybe in the future, we can share that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kaba. Back to you. Excellent. Um, thank you so much, indeed. Um, again, uh, you are in time. Uh, that will allow us for more questions to come. So. Um, the last but not least uh, presenter uh, from our side, I hope he's around, um, is Mr. Wenderson Berrie from uh, the Addis Ababa uh, Health Office. Uh, so the, the floor is uh, yours, uh, my friend uh, Wenderson. I, I understand um, Mr. Wenderson has uh, connectivity uh, problems, um, but I realized he was, he was in. Wenderson? So, um, so um, Dr. Yosef, can you um, take off your screen, please? Um, can you stop screen sharing, uh, Dr. Yosef? So very good. Um, well, I think um, um, I think we are not. We don't really seem to um, get hold of uh, Wenderson Berry from Addis Ababa City um, Health Office. Um, then um, this would uh, basically give us more uh, time for discussion. Um, we have several questions. Um, uh, Dr. Yosef, can you please uh, remove uh, your uh, slide share? Do you hear me? You just say um, leave. So excellent. So very good. Uh, thank you. Thank you indeed. All all the speakers um, they uh, 
really shaded um, interesting um, 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 reflections um, on those issues. And uh, there are a number of um, questions that have come um, from, and uh, for Dr. Adamu, uh, there are a couple of um, questions. Uh, the first one is, um, if you have any information um, on, uh, it's, it's very general update on access to remdesivir um, drug uh, for Ethiopia. And the second one is um, on um, community screening uh, with respect to antibodies. Uh, is there any experience uh, for uh, Ethiopia? Um, if you could um, just, you know, reflect on those ones and then we will move forward um, to others. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Mergisa. Um, so regarding the first question, whether there is a remdesivir, uh, I don't think so, but maybe, I mean, I'm not involved in, uh, in the clinical management. Dr. Dasalo could possibly also, but as far as my information goes, uh, I, I don't think uh, this uh, antiviral is available in the country. Um, about the community screening with, with antibodies, this is not, uh, again, officially integrated in the, um, in, in, in the current, um, uh, um, in the current public health uh, monitoring uh, in, in strategies, but this is under consideration. And I was involved in one exercise where uh, zero surveillance was piloted through a cross-sectional uh, zero survey in Addis. And we have found uh, some interesting, um, uh, observe, uh, we have observed that there is uh, an extent of uh, um, uh, exposure to SARS-CoV-2 uh, more than what we would have, uh, 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 would, would say is there based on the RT-PCR. So we have uh, made a recommendation that this should continue and I think there is some something going on at the ministry level, and we have also planned to move into community-based uh, screening. Uh, there are issues I have seen also in the comment related to the quality of uh, which test to use, uh, sensitivity, specificity, and the like. And we are also doing some validation uh, in in the country. So hopefully this will uh, follow follow suit soon. Thank you. So, um, so thank you, thank you so much. Um, thank you, I, I very much appreciate that. Uh, there are a couple of questions for Bezawit. Um, um, what to do to address the concerns of uh, NCD patients? Uh, I mean, you have highlighted some of the concerns, but then what is it that uh, you would say uh, in, in order to address those concerns? And what is the role of health extension workers uh, in dealing uh, with NCDs? NCD patients uh, during this difficult time. Uh, is there anything that you would say? And perhaps uh, we will follow up with the same uh, question again with Dr. Dasalo as well. Yes, Dr. Dasalo. Uh, no, Bezawit, sorry. Okay, Dr. Melissa, uh, thank you so much. Uh, for the first question, what to do to address uh, NCD patients' concern? Uh, Normally, we as a team who have conducted this research, we recommend that uh, um, all uh, prevention and control strategies uh, in the first place, all means, uh, maybe the health communication intervention, maybe uh, the budget for research or any kind of uh, uh, strategy for the prevention and control of COVID-19 uh, should target uh, NCDs uh, separately. So it should give a separate and uh, like a bigger attention for NCDs. So uh, by that, uh, we can address uh, our NCD patients' uh, challenge and concern. Uh, for the second thing, uh, the role of health extension workers. Uh, we basically conduct uh, this study uh, in Addis uh, because at the time of uh, our uh, uh, study period, uh, the regionals or the regions and uh, the capital city Addis are, are in different states in the spread of COVID-19 in the country. So uh, when community transmission is there in Addis, uh, that might not be there in uh, regional areas and so on. 
So all the things, the challenge and uh, uh, even uh, the um, like the healthcare facility visits or the awareness level, everything is different from addis to the regions. So that uh, we focus on addis separately uh, from the regions. Uh, so uh, that in general, these health extension workers are mostly uh, more uh, involved in uh, regional areas or in the regions. But uh, as we recommend and as our healthcare professionals who are participating in this study uh, recommend uh, uh, this community engagement uh, by which when healthcare professionals go to house to house for COVID testing, they ask uh, for NCD patients and whether that NCD patient has a need of uh, health need or anything so that uh, we can use these health extension workers to strengthen this uh, community engagement. So more to engage uh, to the communities uh, or while uh, going to house to house and so on. So I recommend and my team recommend these health extension workers more to involve, uh, to engage as a community. Thank you so much. Very good. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Bezawit. Uh, so um, to Dr. Dasalo, uh, I think if you could um, comment on remdesivir uh, as well, and uh, uh, secondly, um, is there any strategy to improve NCD service utilization, um, space, especially during this difficult time? Um, is there any um, targeted strategy from, uh, let's say, and guidance from the Ministry of Health on this, or um, for, for that matter, from the hospital? Um, and secondly, is there any strategy strategy to reach out to patients at home uh, by health professionals. Um, uh, if there is no, why not? And what is it that uh, uh, you guys are uh, envisioning in as far as uh, providing those services are concerned? These are um, three questions to you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, as far as I know, Radmisivir is not available in Ethiopia. It is uh, an expensive uh, drug developed by Gilead. And the consumption is still in uh, developed countries is not uh, satisfied and it's not available and say an expensive drug and uh, it's not available regarding uh, non-communicable uh, disease uh, care and treatment in this country uh, it's not uh, yet the program is not yet mature so uh, the uh, there is no registry there is no established registry for non-communicable disease so there are initiatives in uh, chronic rheumatic heart disease that works well but in other diseases, there is no established registry. Second, there is no means that uh, uh, back referral systems are established. For example, I can't uh, refer back a diabetic patient to the lower facility through the system for uh, further follow-up and continuation. The other thing is non-communicable diseases by nature are uh, polymorbid. One patient to have uh, uh, multiple problems for example, a patient can have diabetes, hypertension, asthma, uh, uh, heart failure, and so on, that requires um, a specialist care, and it cannot be handled by a health extension worker or in a primary health care uh, services, because uh, the health care service by its nature, not yet matured, laboratories are not there to determine their blood sugar, renal function test, electrolytes, the lipid profile, and monitoring services. And there is no also a system established. So as a, a response for a COVID response, the best way that we can manage this patient is through virtual clinic or phone clinic services. So that, that should be documented. For example, our phone clinics are like uh, uh, the virtual clinics that every complaint of the patient is documented in, on patient's record. It's not like a call center uh, service, but the, the information that was delivered to the patients, the patient's complaints and the treatments prescribed are documented in the registration, in the patient's electronic medical regist registration that can be run by a professional, a healthcare professional. So if we promote uh, this uh, virtual uh, facility, it's important to reach more patients. The other thing is uh, we are not also screening. We are not now screening patients with hypertension. We are not screening diabetic patients. We are not screening cervical cancer. We are not screening breast cancer. So a lot of patients are still getting complicated. So this should be also 
uh, reactivated and reinitiated. The other challenge that we are facing is when we when a patient from a region, like for example, a patient may be in the regional town, and when we uh, tell the patient collect your medications from uh, the local hospital, and the local hospital says that your follow up is uh, in Black Line in Tokurambasa Black Line Hospital, you have to go there and collect your medications there. So we have tried to solve this problem by writing a letter. Uh, the Ministry of Health write a letter to cooperate in this critical period to those patients who are not even belong to your domain, you have to supply medications and so on. So we are working uh, on this uh, and a lot is expected from partners uh, as well, those who are working on non-communicable diseases to take patients as cohorts, as cohorts and we have to ask each patient on the record what happened uh, to him or her. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. That's quite useful. So the last question um, is um, to Dr. Yosef. Um, Dr. Yosef, uh, and obviously, you know, the rest of you may also comment on this. Is there any lesson that um, uh, we've learned from HIV AIDS uh, to inform our uh, COVID and NCD uh, response in this country? Um, could there be any, any lesson that we can uh, be able to draw on that. So, Dr. Yosef and the rest of you could as well uh, comment on that. Uh, well, I, I don't know exactly how they learned. Uh, actually, HIV, uh, as you know, is a, a chronic, a chronic problem, a chronic disease, more like NCDs, uh, and uh, COVID is uh, an acute illness and. Uh, an epidemic, so there is some difference, but of course we learn a lot of things uh, uh, from a chronic care model that we can uh, replicate to an acute care. Uh, but uh, one thing I would like to say with regard to the response to COVID, uh, uh, something that I should say, I think um, one, one, one area is the investment on uh, PCR and testing, uh, we have somehow to make that co uh, the cost benefit to calculate the cost benefit there and probably go to antibody and uh, antigen testings if those are available. The other thing is with regard to mainly what we can do for COVID is a supportive management and our setup. And uh, I think uh, uh, particularly we have to focus probably Dr. Dasal also can comment on that more. We have to focus on patients, admitting patients who are really uh, need admission, need oxygen or other support, like, uh, uh, you know, if they have problems with uh, coagulopathy, uh, complications, either it's a respiratory failure or it is a coagulopathy problem. So uh, rather than admitting mildly sick, moderately sick patient as uh, we sometimes see. The other point I want to raise is uh, as a supplement to Dr. Dasalo, we need a system, a system uh, whereby uh, big hospitals like Black Line and other teaching hospitals are uh, benefit from uh, the, the help by primary care. Uh, very rightly he said specialist care is needed in NCDs because of the polymorbid nature. Uh, but there are a lot of patients who go to big hospitals just for a refill of medication. And most of the time, not for their evaluation. So their uh, visit has to be spaced so that they don't waste time, money on traveling. And also the waiting time is uh, also frustrating and one reason for loss to follow. So the big hospitals benefit by transferring out. But this system, of course, has to be created. Uh, this is the best way to do it. Also, patients uh, access for medication and other, uh, other not sophisticated uh, assistant can be uh, uh, delivered at district, primary hospital, and even health centers. In the future, we are even uh, recommending and thinking of, you know, health posts where patients can get just their refill. They don't have to come every month or every two weeks for a refill of medication, but they would have their scheduled 
uh, appointments for evaluation. Six months, some, some of them need only a year's evaluation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, I think, um, thank you indeed. Uh, we have uh, Wenderson, I think, uh, thank you, Bezawit, for, for connecting him with us. So, um, Wenderson, um, can you, I mean, Wenderson is from the Addis Ababa Regional Health Bureau, uh, and he's the NCD coordinator for, uh, for the city where um, basically uh, we have the, the highest heat of uh, COVID-19. So, Wenderson, you have eight minutes. Uh, welcome uh, to this uh, session. And uh, can you please share with us uh, your um, talk, please? Dr. Yosef, if you can. Um, uh... Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the coordinators. Uh, but uh, sorry for the timing, the inconvenience of the network in my area. Uh, as we know, uh, now that the government of Ethiopia mainly gives emphasis on the control and prevention of COVID-19. In addition to this, the Ministry of Health and Regional Health Bureau actively working on essential health services, especially focusing on non-communicable disease. Patients due to the nature of COVID-19, its severity and morbidity and mortality is higher on people living with non-communicable disease than other patients. So, by considering the uh, original health bureau, doing an activities like supportive supervision performance in collaboration with the Ministry of Health and some partners which are working on non-communicable disease facilities. To uh, continue the treatment and prevention activities without any interruption and house house awareness creation was then by urban health extension professionals who are screening COVID-19 in the community. Uh, the other thing, in addition to households uh, visiting by using mass media through television and radio, the presence in service availability is announced for the public to come in the health facility and get their treatment without any uh, interruption. Uh, we also weekly performance then with the health facilities to monitor uh, the facilities what they have done in their facilities. Even if it is uh, not cover all health facilities, our health bureau with some non-governmental organizations provide personal protective equipment like sanitizer, alcohol, face mask, gloves, and so to the, pro the health providers working in non communicable disease to perform their work without any fear. And considering service provision, all non communicable disease services are available in separate place from COVID-19 centers. The COVID-19 centers are alone working for the COVID-19, but other facilities working in non communicable disease in their facilities. There are so many challenges encounter during this time for non-communicable disease activity. One of these is facility-related challenges. Uh, the first one is there is high load, high workload in the most health facilities and more focus given to COVID-19 prevention and control. At the beginning of the COVID pandemic or at the beginning of this disease, there was a high fear of professionals or there is panic in the health professionals. So people do not want to work in non communicable disease facilities because of fear of the disease. Uh, the lack of separate room is the most problem in most health facilities because there is no that much space in most health facilities. So there is no alone services given in most health facilities in our region. Drug in laboratory related interruption is a severe problem, especially nowadays. There are so many facilities to talk out of drugs, laboratory related. There is also shortage of medical equipment like blood pleasure apparatus, chemistry machines, TVC machines, X-ray, ultrasound. All of these medical equipment are very seriously shortage 
in our region, especially in health centers, there is no these materials. Uh, the second one, inpatient related challenge. Fear of acquiring COVID-19 from health facility is the first one. At the beginning of this disease, most of the patients are waiting in their houses. Fear of when they are going to uh, health facilities, they are fearing uh, acquiring this disease from the health facility. And the second one is lack of money to buy the drugs. And instead, they want to buy or purchase food instead of medicines because they are feeling of hunger for the coming uh, days are not known. There are suggested improvements uh, in mental communities. Uh, we should better give more emphasis on these activities, especially in mental communities are more dangerous for these patients when they are exposed to COVID-19, they are severely attacked by disease. So we should give more emphasis for these activities. Uh, it's better to motivate even the health providers working in the facilities by different ways, giving training, uh, giving awareness about the nature of the disease, how to prevent it, and giving more materials for them is very much important because there is shortage of PPE materials in most health facilities. So most health professionals are now exposed to this disease. It's better to give or avail all these PPE materials for any health professionals working in the facility, even working in the community, uh, especially urban health education professionals, they are prone to expose for this kind of disease. There is uh, maintaining the availability of drugs, laboratory reagents, and medical equipment is the most important thing for all health facilities to give better health services. Contact, uh, strengthening the mentorship activities also the best and most important thing is for all health facilities. Uh, contact patients by telephone calls, as Dr. Desaro said, it's better and more emphasis should be given appropriate counseling for them who are sick in their homes and they should come to the health facilities and get their counseling and treatment appropriately. But we should communicate them with a telephone conversation because so many people are nowadays afraid of the disease acquiring from the health facility. So it's better to counsel them and give enough information how to come to the health facility, how to protect them from this kind of disease. It's better to give and use telephone conversation. Well, Desen, you have, you have just two minutes. Okay, okay, I, I have already finished. Seeing the awareness creation by health exchange professionals is the main thing. It's better to give awareness home to home for any person. Uh, most of the people know how to prevent the COVID-19, but in practice, they are not delivered it. They are not practicing. So it's better to demonstrate how to prevent uh, the COVID-19 from acquiring this uh, this is continue media announcement about service readiness and availability is very much important and we should emphasize on these activities ensuring ability of personal protective equipment these are the very important things because nowadays most of these professionals working in health facility even in the community are affected by this thing thank you very much i have already finished that's very good. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, uh, Beza, with, uh, for an excellent intervention to rescue us. Um, so um, so uh, there, there, there are a few more questions uh, that we are actually uh, flagged here. Um, the first question is, is, is for everyone uh, of you, uh, basically, uh, does fear to visit health facility due to COVID-19 justifiable um, you know it's not necessarily within uh, your uh, frame of presentation but however these are important questions uh, is there any experience using a steroid for covid uh, patients um, and uh, another general question when would it be the case that 14 days quarantine be lifted so that uh, you know we can come to uh, ethiopia uh, Rari, you wanted to also flag one more question that could be shared um, between the panelists. Okay, so, um, 
So uh, this, these are questions and uh, meanwhile you can use this opportunity also to, to just you know, make um, a final kind of word uh, with respect to today's uh, presentation within the remaining few minutes. So first, uh, um, uh, Dr. Adam. Thank you. Once again, uh, Dr. Mergisa, um, I think the, uh, the concern of uh, patients with NCDs, when, uh, uh, whether they should come to health facilities or, or not, uh, I think the concern is valid. Generally, we all should be cautious, uh, right? So they should be cautious in general terms, but uh, patients with non-communicable diseases should have extra caution. So that's important. So what transport do they use? Uh, what measures should they uh, take to keep themselves safe is important. So they shouldn't avoid health facilities all in all, but they should take the precaution measures and maybe talk to the facilities ahead of time before visiting uh, because the repercussions could be uh, worse. But I think the clinicians should maybe comment more on on that about the quarantine the 14 days quarantine when should it be or when would it be over it is something difficult to tell at the moment yeah. because we are climbing up the, the curve at the moment so it depends uh, and uh, we are still doing contact tracing within 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 addis so the same will follow if, if the situation's improved i think uh, we might still have the quarantine for a while for for the safety of uh, all of us. So I would say stay tuned and let's see what the evidences would tell us in the coming um, weeks. Otherwise, my general remark is about uh, health facility resilience. I think we need to think seriously about the resilience of health facilities, not right after the pandemic or the emergency, but even before. Mm -hmm. So these preparations should be uh, uh, a learning curve so that even post COVID, we need health facilities should be uh, capacitated to, to be resilient in such circumstances so that essential services would continue. And I think there are some com documents coming up from WHO and so the like uh, to, to do so. So I would just would like to advocate for resilience at health facilities at all levels, not only hospitals, but as mentioned by my colleagues. Thank you very much. So thank you. Thank you indeed. Um, it looks like we have only two minutes, guys. Um, it was it was an excellent uh, session absolutely um, bound by time we have to close uh, this down uh, despite the fact that you may have some words to say um, but um, i am allowed to just finish it in time and uh, I'd, i would like to thank everyone um, uh, for participation uh, the quarantine part uh, obviously we have given some advisory um, you know caution about it uh, government may come out and give uh, some direction on that one. So stay tuned, as Adam said. Um, otherwise, I will, uh, yeah, I mean, this is a very good opportunity for us to collaborate with uh, all partners uh, involved in today's uh, session. Um, thank you indeed from my side, and I'll uh, get you back to uh, Hala and team. Uh, thank you indeed. Have a great uh, evening and, and day. Okay. Hala. Thank you very much, Mergissa, and thank you to all the speakers for this amazing panel and for sharing all those lessons and insights. We hope to see you again in our coming webinars. Also, thanks to GIZ and Ted for co-hosting this webinar with us, and we look forward for more collaborations in the future. Next week's webinar will be about malnutrition across the spectrum and the increased health risks during the COVID-19 pandemic. If you have any questions, please, you, uh, please send them to our email, info at easter.eu, and thanks to all the attendees for joining and interacting during this webinar. We hope to see you again in the coming webinars. The recording of this webinar will be available in our YouTube channels, newsletters, and websites, uh, Easter Global Health, uh, Easter, <laughs> Easter and uh, IJHN. And don't forget to check our COVID-19 portal. Thanks every, everyone and uh, stay safe. <laughs> see you next week.